Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Daniel Fass. I'm the head of the Department of Sociology here at Trinity College Dublin. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this fourth event in the TCD UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series. The series is supported by the Policy Institute here at Trinity College. It brings internationally acclaimed speakers to our campus to discuss contemporary sociological issues. The aim of this public lecture series is to promote informed and non-partisan debate and to offer new ideas on cutting-edge sociological issues, including but not limited to responses to the current crisis. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome and thanks to Jakobu Anaya, who is filming the event tonight, my co-organizers of this lecture series, Professor Sinisha Malisevic and Dr. Andreas Hess, who is here from UCD, and Dr. David Landy from Trinity College. This lecture series was launched in January of this year with a talk on expulsions by Professor Saskia Sassen. This was followed by Professor Les Bach's keynote on life sociology and methodological crises in February. And Professor Jan Philipp Reinsma who spoke about trust and violence in May. Tonight I'm very honored that the president of the British Sociological Association, Professor John Holmwood, is here with us to discuss universities in crisis, markets versus publics, a topic of great societal relevance. It juxtaposes the neoliberal model that conceives education as a market commodity with the egalitarian view that calls for equal opportunities for all citizens. In 2005, Professor Kathleen Lynch of UCD delivered a keynote paper to the European Conference on Educational Research that was organized that year at UCD. In it, she argued that with the rise of the neoliberal agenda, there is an attempt to offload the cost of education and indeed other public services on the individual. There's an increasing attempt to privatize public services, including education, so that citizens will have to buy them at market value rather than have them provided by the state. Uh, end of quote. Schools and universities in Europe and beyond operate increasingly as businesses and need to supplement their income from private philanthropic sources. Ireland, Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin are no exceptions in this process. So I'm greatly looking forward to Professor Holmwood's take on this topic. But before I ask uh, Dr. Andreas Hess of, of UCD to introduce our distinguished speaker, let me tell you firstly the format uh, of tonight's event. Professor Holmwood will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. That will be followed by a half an hour question and answer session in which all of you have a chance to engage with him uh, on this very interesting and timely topic. And secondly, let me flag up the next event in the TCD UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series, which is already taking place in 12 days from today, on Tuesday the 26th of November at 7 p.m., right here in the same venue, when we have Professor Valerie Amero of Montreal University with us. And she will speak about Muslims in Europe, veils in public spaces, and the current political crisis. The registration for this event are already open via the Department of Sociology homepage. Email invitations are also currently being circulated, but I would now like to invite Dr. Andreas Hayes to introduce our distinguished guest. Okay, thanks very much. I would first like to thank UCD and, and Daniel, uh, my co-organizer, that we found asylum here tonight because the idea was that we would alternate between UCD and TCD, but Newman House was uh, turned out to be booked for uh, an uh, award ceremony, so we couldn't have that, so uh, thanks for granting us asylum here for, for the evening. Um, <coughs> so I would like to introduce uh, Professor John Homewood, who is um, our guest here tonight, who is currently Professor of Sociology at the University of Nottingham. Um, as to his career and his uh, education, he first studied social and political science at Cambridge University, then became afterwards a teaching assistant in sociology at UCLA, um, and returned to Cambridge to, do, to complete his PhD then. His first post was with the university of, newly founded University of Tasmania, and then uh, he changed jobs and became the director of the Graduate School of Social Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Since then, uh, he moved around uh, and has been a couple of years at the University of Sussex, where he was professor of sociology, uh, and also the dean of the School of Social Sciences and Cultural Studies. From there to the University of Birmingham, um, where he was the head of the department, and now uh, he is obviously at the University of Nottingham, as I said before. He's currently the president of the British Sociological Association, and in that function also 
try and to rally the troops a little bit in terms of defending the public university and what we might call public, public sociology. Uh, in terms of research interests, um, he just finished uh, a Lieberman-funded project on moral economy uh, of inequality, and part of this research related to the defense of the public university is, is linked to that. Uh, I strongly recommend uh, one of the books that he's edited directly linked to the topic, came out with Bloomsbury Academic uh, a little bit back, um, Manifesto for the Public, public University. I'm not going to lose much more time. I'm, I'm sure you want to hear more of the speaker and less of me. Uh, let me just say, uh, in preparation for tonight, uh, for the talk, Universities in Crisis, Markets and versus Publics, um, I just had a quick look into what's on my shelf, and the first thing I came across was Robert K. Merton's of a famous essay, most quoted essay, one of the most quoted essays of our time, The Normative Structure of Science from 1942, where he provided a nice little checklist, very short, just four points, uh, that provide a good, yeah, as I said, a nice checklist uh, by which you can measure, you know, how, how this, how, how education works. Uh, four points he made. One was uh, the university should defend, or higher education in general should defend uh, universalism, by which he meant there should be no ethnocentric or nationalist bias, that truth claims uh, are to be subjected to pre-established and personal criteria, that careers are open to talents, uh, that there should be free access to scientific pursuits, and that there should be a certain ethos of democracy, and by that he meant a kind of progressive elimination of restraints. The second point that he raised was, in 1942 maybe it rang a slightly different bell, uh, was that of communism, of course it's not the communism uh, that we know of today, but by that he meant that the findings of science are the product of social collaboration and assigned or reassigned to the community from which they stem. They constitute a common heritage. Um, so the discoveries should be shared, it should be the products, um, and the products of competitions are communicized or socialized, we would say today. Scientific knowledge should be treated as communal property. That was his idea of uh, communism in the sense of, of the higher education. Um, the third point was disinterest disinterestedness. By that he meant uh, a thorough verification of the results the scrutiny of fellow scientists and experts, there should be a rigorous policing of our results. And the fourth point, and I come then to my end of my short introduction here, should be organized skepticism. Um, there should be no suspension of any judgments at any one level of the process of investigation. Um, the power should be continuously questioned wherever it manifests itself. Uh, I can invite you to you know, measure what's going on today with what Robert K. Martin had said in, in 1942 and how far have we have progressed or regressed. It depends a little bit on how you look at it. Well, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure it's a pleasure to have the Merton setting the standard just before you uh, speak, but some of the issues I will be talking about are issues that relate to the Matonian project, and I'm going to suggest that part of the initial development of, the, of public higher education could be seen as a culmination of the Matonian project and the introduction of wider publics into the idea of the university and the idea of science serving universalism and serving the public. But the, the main issues I want to be looking at, the impact of the market on higher education, particularly on its wider public benefits, including its role in democracy, and I think that would link to the, the Mertonian idea. I'm going to talk though, of a neoliberal knowledge regime, and I'm going to talk about a neoliberal knowledge regime in research and in teaching, and its connections to a neoliberal conception of the globalized knowledge economy. And this I'm going to link to the inauguration by neoliberal policies in the 19 onwards of what are wide and widening uh, social inequalities. So I'll just put that graph up across a number of countries, including Ireland, shows a secular decline of inequality, particularly marked in the period post-Merton, coming up until the uh, 1980s. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's the period of the expansion and the project of 
public higher education. It more or less comes to an end in the 1980s in the sense that the, globe, that the idea of the economy is associated now with widening inequalities. And people shift the language from the idea of a knowledge society to the idea of a knowledge economy, where the social is re reduced to the economic. And I'm going to suggest the idea of the public is reduced to, to markets. And this policy of a neoliberal global knowledge economy puts the universities at the center of the production and reproduction of inequality. And I'm going to say for most of us working in universities, we thought of the university and its social mission as associated with the amelioration of inequality. We are now directly enjoined to be part of the engine of inequality. I use 10%, the top 10% uh, of income earners, because that includes all professors, and it includes most university academics in a permanent job after they've been in that job for about five to ten years. So, in that sense, the uh, university is itself a microcosm of the society in which it's placed. And the recent uh, evidence from Britain suggests that widening in the inequalities within the university and the different jobs within the university, that the university system has the widest inequalities of any public uh, uh, activity in the UK. But of course, I mean, what was also mentioned that the uh, inequalities are within generations. Obviously, they are class or socioeconomic inequalities, but they're also inequalities across generations in the sense that what the introduction of the changes does is introduce the idea that the funding of universities should primarily be on the shoulders of the young. And that's a shift from older generations to younger generations. And that's a response to austerity and the idea of uh, reducing the burden of taxation and so on. One can trace neoliberal policy for further and higher education in the UK back to the Jarrett Report of 1985 and various audit measures since then. Many of these things have been introduced in other countries across uh, the piece and are part of the new public uh, manage, management. The process has been incremental, but it has been associated with growing inequality. So, in a sense, within universities, we have not looked at the context in which the university operates closely enough and thought how the developments within the university are, located, are linked to wider development. But although the process is incremental, what I want to talk about is that there's a very radical experiment now taking place that's happening dramatically in two, two places, or one can see it dramatically in two places. In England, because it's not going to be proper to refer to the UK, Scotland is different as people do, uh, and the US, not across the US, but particularly in California. California and the UK were very distinctive in setting in place very similar systems of public higher education. The California master plan of Clark uh, and the public higher education system set into place by uh, Robbins. The California master plan has collapsed as a consequence of starvation by public funds, but the uh, system of higher education set in place by the Robbins report for the United Kingdom in England is being transformed by direct and energetic public policy. And I have to say, you know, that there is nothing incremental now that is happening in England. It is very systematic, very dramatic, and very uh, fast. Clark Kerr referred to the modern university as a multiversity, that is, that there were multiple functions that the university performed. So we're not talking about a, uh, a golden age. When Merton wrote about science and the values of science, he was also writing as science was becoming more and more engaged with uh, uh, the economy, and more and more engaged with the military industrial complex. So the fact of the utilitarian uses of science is not something that I'm challenging. But what I'm challenging is the way in which the multiple functions of the university are being reduced to one function. 
and only one function is being allowed uh, to be met. So the modern university is changing from being a multi-university to being a mono-university. And I'm going to illustrate it with the English example. And I apologize if it looks as if I'm speaking parochially, but I hope what you see is that there is a direct sociological content to what I'm saying, and at least, uh, you know, to say, well, understand what is happening, so this is not, or doesn't become a tale that is told elsewhere, because it really is uh, you know, very striking. So, I'm not going to, get to, I'm going to say that what Robbins did, and I won't sort of read them out, but you can see that nobody writes about the university except that they recognize that one of the functions of the university is about developing a skilled workforce and an educated workforce. That's central to all accounts of the university and all arguments about public investment in, in higher education. What is significant about Robbins is that he places that public benefit in the context of other public benefits, which include cultivation, common culture, standards of citizenship. And he also sets out a principle that higher education should be available to all those who are qualified by ability and attainment to pursue them and wish to do so. And I suggest that that is, Robin certainly wouldn't use a sociological neologism, but that is an idea of a knowledge society. Because what it's describing is an inclusive public interest in higher education. It's, it's a recognition that the individuals who go through higher education get a benefit from it, but it's also saying that that benefit is extended more widely. And indeed, part of the idea of a knowledge society was that one of the benefits of increasing education, increasing investment in education, was precisely its association with a secular decline in inequality. So although Robbins was a liberal economist, he was expecting narrowing of uh, uh, incomes. And one of the reasons why Robbins was doubtful about making individuals pay for their education through loans was precisely because of the impact of education upon the structure of rewards in society. It was less necessary, or there was less argument for doing so when uh, inequalities were, were narrow. But there's also, it's strongly that what Robbins is setting out is education as a social right underpinning democratic inclusion. That's very clear in the idea of what's written in the Robbins report. And higher education associated with economic growth in, the decline, in a context of a secular decline in inequalities is also associated with the expansion of the welfare state. So social rights associated with higher education are also a part of the development of, of a welfare state. And indeed, the idea and the growth of the social sciences in this period is part of a recognition of a need for evidence-based policy, linked in, in the UK, that's linked to the foundation of the Social Science Research Council, the, which became the ESRC, which was also founded in 1965. So this is a, a moment of so the evidence-based policy in this context is for policies which are about social modernization, inclusion, and addressing issues of uh, inequality. So in a way, if I want to say, well, the Mertonian idea of science, universalism, and so on is strongly connected, I think, with the project of social inquiry or a project of scientific inquiry where we naturally understand or kind of understand that the, the nature of social development is a process of inclusion. I think it will look radically different as soon as one starts to think of what the implications are of knowledge being uh, used to drive inequality. That's a completely different uh, concept. And of course also what uh, this idea that I would, uh, uh, in, in Robbins is also emphasize knowledge for citizenship. And it has uh, certain correlates in terms, if I'm going to talk about a neoliberal knowledge regime, what is a knowledge regime that is being replaced by neoliberalism? 
in a way, we didn't really think it was necessary to talk sociologically in these terms. It's only that we are retrospectively having to describe what neoliberalism is transforming, that we start to understand what the correlates of uh, the Robbins project or the California master plan were. And I think although, uh, you know, if one could say, well, these are two uh, you know, very uh, sharply formed, formulated sets of public policies, obviously in other places things are happening in more uh, piecemeal character, more... Uh, you know, different mixes of things going on, but the underlying trend of development is captured, I think, in the Robbins and um, uh, uh, Clark Kerr sorts of arguments. So the period is also the period one of the consolidation of new disciplines and their establishment in the university, and particularly, I think, critical disciplines associated with the public functions of the university. Sociology and other critical social sciences and alternative forms of knowledge started to enter into the academy. So part of the development of education for democracy, the process of inclusion, is a process of an inclusion of alternative epistemologies, alternative forms of knowledge, cultural studies, women's studies, and so on, within the social science uh, area. It's also a period, and again, you know, thanks for mentioning Merton, where if one thinks back of the Weberian idea of the individual vocation of the scholar, where there's also a collectivization of the individual vocation through the idea of professional ethics. And in a sense, when uh, Merton describes the scientific undertaking, the knowledge-producing undertaking, as collective, he's already moved from the idea of a scholarship as an individual vocation to it being a collective professional vocation. This has within it an implicit hierarchy among kinds of knowledges, and these hierarchies are relevant to what is happening today. Pure and applied knowledge, theoretical and empirical knowledge, these are distinctions that are mobilized in the time to understand the organization of uh, collective knowledges. And it's to, going to return around about the 1980s when an alternative is starting to be formed within Novotny and her colleagues' idea of mode one and mode two knowledge. The emergence of new forms of applied knowledge that challenge the hierarchy of pure and applied and so on. But it's important when this argument is put forward that it's initially an argument about mode two knowledge alongside mode one knowledge, which is discipline-based knowledge, speaking to the internal audience of, of the discipline. What I think is happening now, certainly within the UK, the arguments about the impact agenda is an attempt to shift all knowledge into a mode two form of uh, knowledge. But the period also had, as I suggested, a more radical conception of co-produced knowledge and the idea of a public agora, which is what Novotny sets out. And that's, of course, the critical studies, the engagement of sociologies and social sciences with particular kinds of uh, movements for the expansion of democracy and for de democratic uh, you know, reorganization. I know Michael Burroway came and spoke here, but of course, it doesn't make sense to think of the emergence of an idea of public sociology based upon new social movements, except that we're looking at a project of democratization, which is a social project, but also a social project with implications for the university and for the organization of knowledge. And so I think what you have within this period, what developed up until the 1980s was a strong conception of knowledge serving publics, not simply corporations, government agencies, or disciplinary gatekeepers. Indeed, the issue of professional knowledge and its purposes, mode one knowledge, didn't even have to be asked because there was an assumption of the university's relation to a general process of social amelioration. So it was possible to declare oneself you know, ethically neutral or independent of the processes, of wider social processes precisely because the public function 
of knowledge was being sorted by the way in which applied knowledge was linked to social policies which were themselves inclusive and uh, addressing uh, wider inequalities. So then I'm going to wind very quickly forward and say, well, what happens in 2010 in the guise of austerity and claims about the problem of uh, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 is the publication of the Brown Report, which in one perspective can be seen as one more step in an incremental development, but I think is more properly seen as a radicalization of a process which had been piecemeal, partly resisted, partly reincorporated through the capture of the ref by peer group pressures and so on. So we're in a process of the, dis, uh, you know, the uh, uh, dissolution of forms of what, from the perspective of neoliberalism, has been the corporate capture of knowledge in the interests of professionals. So the Brown report, 2010, the white paper in 2011, white paper is called putting students at the heart of the system, but is more properly called putting the market at the heart of the system. Now, just from the point of view of public documents and public discussions, there is something extraordinary about these documents within British public policy. And that is, these are the first <coughs> engagements with higher education to make no reference whatsoever to the public benefits of higher education. Nor how they might be, that those public benefits might be secured after marketization. The only mention in the reports is to a private education in human capital by students and their families and the contribution of universities to economic growth. Itself, one could say, is that economic growth is described or understood by the government as a wider public benefit, but I hope you think in the context of dramatically increasing inequality and what is now widely perceived in policy circles as it being unlikely that economic growth is going to deliver higher real wages, we now actually have a situation where economic growth can't straightforwardly be uh, considered to develop, to uh, be in the wider public interest. But certainly, it's perceived as a benefit for private companies. The Brown Review asks, should therefore private companies pay and invest in uh, higher education? And the answer is no. Sort of complicated reasons of why they answer no. In effect, the decision is to fund higher education by student fees alone, at least in the area of the social sciences uh, and humanities. So Britain now has, England now has, I mean, OECD doesn't separate Brit uh, Scotland and England. And so Britain has the lowest public investment in higher education and at the same time the highest private investment in education. But who is it who's investing? Students. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just... I don't know whether that, that shows you since 2006, uh, eight the dramatic change in the funding of higher education in England. So the dramatic rise in overseas income from overseas students, the dramatic rise in income from home students, the decline in public funding, all other <coughs> sources of income. When the Minister of Education, David Willett, says there are no longer public universities in England. This is what he means. There are no public universities because universities have such little of their income from direct public funds. And the question has to be asked of the, this, well, was the system broken? And it's interesting to talk about system because what, uh, 
Robbins inaugurates and what Clark Kerr inaugurated in uh, the California Master Plan was a system of further and higher education. That is, that one should think of the impact of higher education in terms of how its different parts fitted together and the benefits that were delivered to the public as a consequence of the nature of the system. And so one can ask, was the system broken? Well, there was a report in 2008 uh, by St. Aubin and, and colleagues who made a comparison of different higher education systems to look at their outcomes in terms of teaching and research and in terms of cost effectiveness. British higher education came top for teaching, that is in terms of delivering uh, better outcomes for students, uh, low dropout rates, uh, etc. It produced the best outcomes for research and it was the most cost efficient system, largely because of having driven down uh, uh, funding in 2008. So the system that was transformed in 2010 was a system in 2008 that was being recommended to the EU as the model to be developed. And the one could, thinking about it, one could say, well, let's think about it in terms of how we might think about health. And if we were thinking about, well, is the public advantaged by having a few very good hospitals, or is it advantaged by having a very good health system? So the British health system also has incredibly good outcomes as a system. The American health system has a really poor outcomes as a system. But nobody doubts there's some really fine hospitals in America. They just understand that the people who have access to those hospitals is a very narrow segment of the population. And so what we're getting in describing universities and in the aspirations of universities within the idea of global competition is the place of the university within a rank order, top, uh, global top 100, with the top places in that global 100 taken by American universities. But the American universities that take those places deliver very little for undergraduates or wider parts of the community. They deliver elite education. And even in the United States, the most successful universities for delivering education and research, once one takes into account whether or not they deliver any undergraduate teaching at all, are public universities like <coughs> the University of California, the University of Wisconsin, uh, and so on. So positioning uh, higher education in the context of global competition is actually severing the purposes that the universities serve for national publics. And I'll say in the morning. Uh, well, already you can see there that the great growth of overseas income should lead you to think that what university vice chancellors in England think is the fees they charge to overseas students is what the market will bear. They have now abolished or all uh, teaching subsidy direct funding for undergraduate students in social sciences and humanities is removed. There is now no reason whatsoever for universities to charge any different fee for overseas students and home students. And the ambition the leading vice chancellors is to get home student fees up to the level of international student fees. It's shocking that international student fees are at that level, but as soon as you start talking about a global <coughs> system, there is no reason to differentiate between your local home students and international students, and indeed Vice-Chancellors are already lobbying. The only thing that uh, gets you to think of those uh, differently is the um, uh, 
the restriction on the funding of the student loan system. So that's the fragile bit in the English system now. The loans cost too much to support at higher fees, but there's heavy lobbying to get those, uh, that fee cap, fee cap distributed. So what's happening? What are the features of the neoliberal knowledge regime that is now taking place in England? Already said, education as an investment in human capital and the responsibility of individuals. A temporary cap on fees of £9,000, but designed to rise for elite institutions. That was what the Brown Review said. The only thing the Liberal Democrats did in Britain was put a cap on the fee at 9000 That cap is unstable. And the logic of internationalisation, which is the language that is being discussed, is to remove it. But the only way you could remove it and not produce a bigger cost than the old system that it's replacing is if you can drive down fees elsewhere. So what is designed is to break the system to create elite institutions and to have mass higher education at uh, lower fees. Much lower fees than 9,000 closer to the 6,000 that was uh, initially planned, but I think you will see fees of 5,000 introduced. That's the purpose of getting for-profit providers to enter, including and especially multinational corporations. And in fact, the removal of direct funding of arts, humanities, social science degrees was precisely to make it possible for for-profit higher education to move in. There's no other reason for it. That's why they haven't been removed for those areas where there's no interest for for-profit higher education coming in. Science, engineering, STEM subjects remain publicly subsidized despite the fact that they have much higher earnings prospects and despite the fact from strict neoliberal uh, principles, they should not be subsidised, but the arts and humanities should, if you go back and read Milton Friedman. So the particular for-profits that are waiting, and I think after 2015, because it would be too damaging prior to the uh, election in 2015, are going to come partly from Apollo Group, University of Phoenix, but also from Pearson. So Pearson is building undergraduate degree courses underneath the radar. Because everybody expected for-profits to enter quickly, people think that for-profits have gone away. They haven't. They are consolidating and building their <coughs> entry. And indeed, arguments about open access in Britain, which look like democratic things, publicly funded research should be made available to the public. The purpose of open access, and one sees this in the in terms of the licenses that are being pushed for it, the license for open access is to allow commercial reuse. And what does commercial reuse enable? It enables the repackaging of the research from public institutions into the commercialized curricula of uh, for-profit organizing. They don't even have to invest in libraries. And it's the same with the access to big data. So the arguments about making data available is an argument to monetize big data, to commercialize it, and in the very act of commercializing it, to take it out of open access again. So there is no uh, process by which the commercial mixing of, of data, the commercial remixing of texts, allows that remix go back into the public domain. That remix is a commercial product. And that includes techniques of the analysis of big data will become proprietary techniques if you wish to uh, use them. The impact agenda is a commodifying agenda. I have to say, you know, if you want a caption of what is meant by impact agenda in Britain, it means shorten the time from idea to income. 
that the converting idea to income is what is intended, and one sees that through the arguments about license. And so again, uh, open access is about making research available to small and medium enterprises, thereby encouraging academics and the sciences to license their knowledge under private property, so intellectual property rights and so on. But crucial to what is happening, I've mentioned the Clark Kerr argument about the multiversity. There will no longer be multiversities, or there will only be a few multiversities. Because the language that is being used, is, and it's used by Pearson, and Pearson are very uh, radical advocates of this policy, organizing uh, uh, influence within think tanks, the policy exchange group, and so on, and publishing their own arguments on it. The unbundling of the university, that is, separating out the functions of a university and commercialising them. That means separating teaching from research. That means separating support staff from employment within the university and making them employed by outsourced uh, companies. So you will get a bundled elite university and unbundled teaching only universities and the unbundled teaching universities will precisely be the ones that are vulnerable to the for competition with for-profit companies and uh, uh, for-profit companies are in a sense seeking to uh, uh, undo that. And again if you think, ah, no, he must be making this up. Universities UK has a series of reports on modernization and efficiency. Because obviously, if you decide as a vice chancellor that you're going to get more money out of students, you've pushed to have the fees raised to them from effectively 3,000 to 9,000, and you want the fee cap to be removed. The language within the university becomes twofold. One, it becomes the language of, oh my gosh, these students are paying more. We must manage their expectations. And they might demand more, so let's tell them not to demand more. That's managing their expectations. But the other thing is, let's give them value for money. What does it mean to give them value for money when you're taking a huge amount of money off them? What it means is actually driving down costs locally Phase one is outsourcing of the uh, support services of the university into companies like uh, Serco, G4S, and, and so on. Company, you know, big multinational companies lobbying in relation to health services as well as uh, <coughs> uh, education. But phase two of the programme explicitly set out by Universities UK is we have to take this to other functions of the university, research and teaching. That's massive online courses, is how they say. And the government now starts talking language of freeing the university. And what is a university to be free to do? It should be free to pursue for-profit activities and to seek for-profit partners and indeed even to change their corporate form. That is, amongst the lobbying documents and various things you see, you see the possibility of managerial buyouts of universities. Being put forward as radical, disruptive ideas that might help uh, create, uh, uh, <coughs> create a, a, a market. And I, I, um, I'll just show you another slide so you can see that, I mean, I think a lot of, well, I don't know, who knows what vice chancellors think, because vice chancellors have declared themselves incapable of public thought in uh, British context now. They will not make a public utterance about anything happening within the university. And somebody said, oh, John, you want them to be on the barricades? I said, no, I don't want them to be on the barricades. I want them to just mildly involve themselves in saying <laughs> what they think universities are about. You can't even find this. In fact, it has become such you know, a statement of satire that they've decided 
that the name Vice-Chancellor is a difficult term for people to understand what they are. Well, only because they don't say what they are and don't say what the universe is. So they say, what we want to be known from now on, we wish to be known as Chief Executive Officers. <laughs> That's that. Well, Chief Executive Officers who think that they might benefit. This is how many universities do you think are going to succeed in the brave new world? So that's the structure, the distribution of higher education. Obviously, there are different sized universities here. But I reckon, at best, the elite starts here. But really, it starts here. Fact. It starts up here. There aren't going to be many winners in the situation that, but all the vice chancellors in this group here don't want to say anything about what's happening in case anybody thinks, I'll use Mrs. Thatcher's word, I can't believe she, in case people think they're fripped, that is, that they're frightened of what might, you know, that they think that they might not be one of those who's going to get free. But the, this is the stratification of higher education that's emerging in Britain. But part of what is happening, why this is happening, as I say, is one should think of neoliberalism not simply as a public policy applied to it. It is a theory of knowledge. That's why it's so important for us within universities to address neoliberalism not as a policy applied to things, but as actually a theory of knowledge. And the key issue from... Uh, of neoliberalism as a theory of knowledge is that it understands the market as a solution to what they see as a problem of knowledge. The problem of knowledge is one of exclusion, problem of monopoly, and monopoly is understood to involve the collective appropriation of power. Obviously the state is perceived as a form of mo monopoly and so there's a state market dichotomy there. And that state to market dichotomy is now being applied to higher education. Or even if universities have never been state-directed and occupy a different status. And from the perspective of uh, neoliberalism, monopoly doesn't arise as a consequence of market failure, but as a failure to establish markets. That's why all the emphasis is on deregulation. And from their perspective, the market is a means of aggregating knowledge based upon individual points of view deriving from different locations and interests. So they have a kind of quasi-democratic view of how the market might operate in those terms. Social organization, especially where collectively created, is a potential distortion. So it's no accident that Merton identified collegiality in the collective uh, organization of knowledge. And that's precisely what neoliberalism attacks, the collective organization of anything. And social organization is a problem from the perspective of neoliberalism, which is also a critique of society and an argument for rational public policy designed to produce market-aligned behavior. So if you look at the policy agenda in Britain, the policy agenda is how to produce evidence to create market-aligned or rationally or rational behaviours. That's from a short uh, description of nudge. And so one might say is the paradox of what is happening from the perspective of, say, a Mertonian approach to this. The classic Mertonian critique of Burawai was that Burawai politicised the process of knowledge production against the universalism and disinterest that Merton describes. But what is happening behind our backs is, in a sense, the politicization of knowledge production through its marketization, and through the representation of the market as a neutral mechanism, a mechanism which will take the politics out of policy. It only takes the, policy out, the politics out of policy by reducing policy to the market. So marketization is a process of the deliberate depoliticization. 
And that includes, I suggest to you, even the process of holding the government to account is now being argued within British public policy, English public policy, because Scottish Assembly won't go in that direction. <coughs> because what is being discussed is the use of big data commercially in order to uh, take over what were previously public uh, uh, agencies supported by the government to provide the means of criticizing and holding uh, government to account. So uh, one of the white papers suggesting it has been privatized. The language it doesn't use private, it says it's been mutualized. Mm -hmm. I, it's going to be, well, you know, what you, most of you know that the English middle class love John Lewis. It's, it's so long as they can describe everything as if it's a branch of Lewis's, it looks as if it might be acceptable. So the, the um, uh, behavioral change unit is going to be a mutual in which there will be government investment, private venture capital investment, and uh, self-ownership by the academics in it. That's the commercialization of uh, academic. And if any of you follow health sector debates in Britain and know about the holding hospitals to account by above and below average death rates, that is provided, data is provided by Dr. Foster, a private commercial organization of academics, venture capital, government investment to hold public sector hospitals to account. So there is a massive project of commercialization taking place in the area that the social sciences have regarded themselves as providing evidence for policy. And the problem will be is getting access to the data. You know, you can get access to Dr. Foster's data, you have to pay for it. You have to pay to use their proprietary uh, techniques. And this goes through a whole series of uh, policy interventions, something called What Works, which is the reinterpretation of evidence-based policy as policy-based evidence. What works, given the inequality, given Rising inequality, what would work given that we're going to do nothing about inequality? Given that if you say, well, what would work is reducing inequality, that is not a problem. And so you're getting the re engineering in the UK of social sciences towards forms of behavioural science that deny social structural determinants of behaviour except as external contextual features. And so I'd say that the very nature of social science is being shaped to be, and we've got the rise of what I call anti-social structural sciences. It is, however, I won't go into a bad science policy, but of course, that would be to use the evidence about whether this science policy works. So just now finish on saying, well, what is really going on. And I think we'd like to now say, well, what neoliberalism is, in order to sh sharpen this, is to say it's an attack on publics. It's wrong to think of these issues as in terms of the dichotomy or a dualism between state and market. And in the more expanded version of this, I refer to John Dewey's argument about the state is itself dependent upon publics. One shouldn't think of the state as straightforwardly representing the public interest. What one needs is for publics to be able to self-represent themselves and form themselves and through that place their interests in the context of uh, the formation of uh, policy. So I'd say, well, the public is by definition dialogical. That is, you couldn't have a public except that it was formed in discussion, conversation, and in uh, dialogue. The major contrast with the market is that the market is non-dialogical. The market is an aggregate of uh, perceived 
self-interested individuals acting in a self-directed way, whereas markets necessarily have to introduce the issue of other direction and consideration of the impact upon others. So it seems to me very significant, and this is, I'd say, well, how this ties up with a moral economy. I'd say, well, what a moral economy would be about is reinstating publics, reinstating dialogue, not taking uh, politics out of policy, but putting politics into policy, which is, in a sense, to put publics back at the centre of policy formation. And so the attack upon the public university is highly significant because the public university serves as a space for the production and dissemination of knowledge, including the evaluation of expertise. So for me, it's highly significant that current neoliberal reforms attack the public university through the privatization and marketization of its functions. So I would say, well, what the privatization of the public university is anti-democratic, but it also seeks to reconfigure the social sciences to establish the hegemony of anti-social science as well. And if we place this in the context of the professional commitments that Merton set out, I would suggest you we can no longer be Mertonians because the context in which Merton anticipated is no longer the context in which we uh, operate. And the functions of knowledge cannot be any longer be separated from issues of democracy. So we're called, I think, to respond to what's happening to universities, but also to what's happening to the wider society, to respond not simply as social scientists, but also as citizens. several things there. Uh, I, would, I mean, because I have uh, written about that one shouldn't use the idea that there is a politicization going on through marketization for a more radical politicization of the university. What one is doing is trying to protect the space of the university as a space for dialogue. That requires certain ways of being open to other kinds of possibilities and other kinds of uh, uh, criticisms of viewpoints. So there's no way I would wish to exclude neoliberalism 
from the space of discussion within the university. What I'm pointing out to is the neoliberal attack upon the university as a means of excluding other positions you know, from within it and by directing everything towards uh, <coughs> the impact agenda. So I'm not generally in favor of using things like professional associations for particular kinds of political projects. And I don't write, ever indicate I'm like president of the British Sociological Association, even when campaigning for the public university, even though I think it would be madness if all prof if professional associations didn't support that uh, kind of stuff. You know, I would rather argue it as something to persuade my fellow sociologists to engage in this campaign, but not, in a sense, persuade the British Sociological Association as a corporate uh, entity to do it. And I think that there is a diff difference. I think the significant thing, I, I, you know, would, uh, had I planned my time better, right? let me just show you what the public... Uh, People often say, why should people invest in liberal education? Why should there be public funding? And, uh, hang on, it's the one before I want. The public is completely <coughs> hostile to the changes that are taking place. So it's kind of interesting about politicians that they wouldn't dare present these arguments, despite the fact that they would be presenting them to a public that largely agrees with the arguments that they wouldn't dare to present. So 65% of the British public thought tuition fees should be the same across all the universities. 70% thought that university was about more than simply you know, getting a better job and so on. So these are the public attitudes. And when I talk to colleagues, they say, oh, the problem is we haven't persuaded the public. And I say, well, the problem is you haven't understood that the public actually agree with you. That's your problem. You don't even want to engage with a public that agrees with you. But look at who doesn't agree with us. So the interest in, and the aspiration for higher education as being universal. The big debate on social mobility in Britain at the moment. And uh, uh, David Cameron described himself as absolutely, absolutely mortified that uh, people from private education don't seem to dominate British public life. How could it happen? <laughs> it's because we got rid of... Uh, we, because we got rid of uh, grammar schools, and the problem is working class aspirations. There's absolutely no evidence that, of the absence of aspirations. What there is is an absence of opportunities. And as soon as you create a polarised job market, you create a situation in which social mobility has to take large steps when everybody knows it's easier with small steps. How did I go to university? I didn't go to university by having a plan to go to university. I went through school doing what you do in school, and then, oh gosh, you know, I'm supposed to apply to university. So it becomes a natural process of, uh, of how you go through, and that's how the middle class goes to university. The problem is that for others, they're living in a context of, of deprivation where other more, what they might initially think of as more realistic aspirations, are closed off for them. So why should they expect the unrealistic? Look at who's giving up on public uh, higher education. It's not people without qualifications. So again, the government said, look, you know, why should the taxi driver, why should the, child, the taxi driver pay middle class education? It's because the taxi driver has an aspiration for his or her children to go to university. But where the support for publicly funded higher education is falling is amongst graduates. They are backing off public funding. They're the ones who got publicly funded. This is the ladder being lifted up afterwards. And this is the recognition of education as a positional good. And this is saying, well, actually, if there are more graduates, it might be the way Robbins described, incomes and differentials may narrow. Let's stop that from happening. So there's just absolute hypocrisy in the discussion, in the discussion of aspirations and commitment. The public would support 
liberal education. In fact, by and large, they'd be surprised to find that politicians and vice chancellors don't. Could you please state your name and your affiliation as well? Uh, my name is uh, Pat Al, and I was in here today as a graduation for uh, education. I'm the president of the AFTI, so that's my reason for being in here. But I, 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 what I would say is that what you talk about the language there, taken from Thornton, the, the market, the CEO, the value for money, the driving down costs, and so on. I think we're missing the point really in all of this discussion that is going on between liberals and neoliberals and all the rest of them because it is really the bankers of the world that have taken over. There is a very interesting book called uh, uh, Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Have Come Through the World by a Wall Street insider journalist and he describes fairly well what is happening. The second part of the name of the book, How Goldman Sachs Have Come Through the World. And on today's uh, times over in your country, <coughs> Goldman Sachs and uh, the other investment banks involved in the privatization of the uh, Royal Mail made 1.2 million in probably two weeks. Now that's the kind of thing that goes on and is going on, and the banks are really in control. They, 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 it took somebody like FDR to put a new deal over in the States when the banks were taken out, but then the Thatcher and Reagan coming in and letting the market free reign. And we have a situation here in Ireland with regard to banks. We gave 64 billion to bail out two toxic banks that should never have been there, and the other two are now privatized. So what is happening is that the language of bankers has come in right all over. And as you say, the, the, the novice and, and presidents of, of, of universities now want to call themselves CEOs, which is the language of bankers. So until somebody comes in and stands up in simple language to these bankers, and I could use another word to write the bank, but, but I won't in this, in this kind of ground here. But that is the problem. And it, it, it was, it was, we have an example of it where, where FDR in his new deal did stand up to it. And he found, because he was president for four times, he was able to stand up to him in his last two terms. And the business side and the banks were put in their place, but they have come full circle, never in the history of civilization have the banks so much power they have today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't at all uh, disagree with you. If we were talking about offshore venues in which money was kept, and, you know, to avoid taxation, we'd have to recognize, certainly within Britain, that London is an offshore centre or the manipulation of, of, of finance. So we are in a situation where our governments are captured by offshore elites. I mean, I, you know, I do think, uh, you know, education is important, but I hope it will be clear that I think inequality is even more important, and that I don't think these levels of inequality is sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable to have elite-dominated politics that is no longer in the interests of the public. And the vacuum that will be created by the absence of a politics on behalf of the poor and disadvantaged is the, it's usually filled by fascism. So I think we are living in a moment of, uh, you know, of, of the possibility of, of fascism. And indeed, you know, my commitment to uh, moral economy comes through the tradition of Karl Polanyi. Karl Polanyi wrote precisely about globalization, which he called the planetary economy, and the simple, the simplicity of the idea of freedom in liberalism at that time was what created the space for a fascist response. But I think we just have to get increasingly outraged about 
This is, I mean, I don't know if people saw the reports of the city of Detroit going bankrupt. In going bankrupt, will they pay the bankers or will they pay the pensions of poor people in uh, Detroit? And they will pay the they will pay the bankers. And it's you know, and in a sense, they are too big to fail, but they can't even perceive uh, what it would be for them to do something different. Wasn't there the debate between uh, two you know bankers about you know their income six million, four million, ten million pounds, two bankers in Britain that represented the totality of the British contribution to the Philippines uh, and the treatment of two bankers debating if it would be wrong for one of them to only get four million when another got six million. Okay, there was another question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Laura Campbell. Um, I'm a lecturer in a business school in Trinity. Don't, don't kill me. No, that's not a job. But I, I really enjoyed your talk and I completely agree with it and I concur with the last speaker. I mean, just very modest things that if corporations could just pay their own tax oh. uh, uh, burden, we might not be even having this conversation in the first place. But uh, my question is this. Um, it's precisely uh, the business school that seems to occupy a sort of interstitial position um, within the university. And I wonder if you can comment on uh, the first principles of a business school um, and also comment on what I see happening in the UK and a lot of business schools where um, a lot of um, business schools seem to actually be the place for um, more radical uh, Marxist economists and the more radical end of a very uh, neoliberal sociology um, uh, elite that is in the UK at the moment. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I didn't say anything negative about no, I know, business, I know. business schools, um, <laughs> specifically not because you know business is something that should be studied. And of course, in arguing that um, <coughs> You know, we want our students to get jobs. Some of them are going to get jobs in business. So one would wish them to be good at their work in business. But one would also wish them to have a much more expanded idea of what it is that a you know, the purposes a business might have, purposes towards its workforce, purposes towards the uh, you know, people who live in the environment of a business, around a business, and so on. And these were, that, that was standard stuff within business schools, as you say. And it is correct that uh, you know heterodox economics in Britain lives in business schools. It lives in business schools as a consequence of neoliberal policies directed towards <laughs> universities and the response of econ economists to purify their discipline, go for RAE success, and in a sense get rid of. Uh, um, you know, uh, heterodox review, views within it because they didn't score well in the, the impact factors of the journals and so on. So there are certainly real problems and dysfunctions in the way in which disciplines are organized and how they've reacted towards the uh, uh, audit measures within Britain and the, the, the face of economics, I would say, is much more problematic than the situation of you know, business schools. How, that said, however, you will find that what is happening is heterodox economics is now being pushed out of business schools in Britain, and an alliance between psychology and uh, behavioral economics in Britain is becoming one of the dominant features within business schools. So sociological organizational studies and so on, you know, feel the squeeze, or at least that's how colleagues in business schools report that. Probably you'd be able to hear me better than I can. My name's Joseph Bailey, uh, I'm just a student, uh, nothing more complicated than that, I'm not really able to hear than that. Um, I just uh, like to question the way you framed it. Um, you framed it uh, markets versus publics, and I know you seem to be coming from a point of view that includes the markets, but feels the market isn't including you. And I'm just wondering if you could envisage a sociology or a philosophy of knowledge, or a philosophy of social knowledge, that would um, rather be either or, but both and. So it's it's market and public and politics in a, in a kind of a 
unified kind of respect. Yeah, I uh, absolutely agree with what you're saying. That's how I would uh, normally frame it. So my, you know, uh, my background sociological assumptions are from American pragmatism. I'm not Marxist in orientation at all. My you know, commitments are to the possibility of reform. That means the possibility of embedded and regulated markets. So I couldn't be hostile to the idea that markets serve some valuable uh, public functions. The question is that the, the, the valuable public functions that markets serve should be a matter of public deliberation, not a matter of assumption. Indeed, one of the paradoxes of our time is that neoliberalism, the theory of the markets, has taken on the form of a critical theory. That is that it's utopian. So the Polanyi argument about the market is that the pure market is a utopia. So there are no pure markets in practice. So markets are always you know, embedded in social relations. But what you have is a theory of markets, which is a theory of them based upon their disembedded form. So what I'd say is what we need to do is critique the theory of markets in order to have a practice around markets that enables us to judge when market-based uh, practices are uh, satisfactory, meet our needs, meet our aspirations, and so on. And that includes a judgment about the consequences of markets in terms of the disruption of lives of some you know, people. So, for example, if we decide by public policy that it's necessary to create economic conditions in which unemployment rises, then that's the responsibility of public decision, not a responsibility of the unemployed. So the paradox is we pathologize the victims of public policy, and we don't take on responsibility for the policy that a public enacts. So a policy where the public said, well, unfortunately, some unemployment is going to be necessary, is a politics which would recognize the public service that the unemployed make in rebalancing an economy, and then seeks to protect them from the longer-term consequences of that action. And I say, well, that's in a sense, what a responsible, pragmatic politics that overcame a dualism of state versus market. So the idea of a public is not to, in a sense, create markets versus public. What it's trying to set out is the market is set against the state, but is really dissolves the very substance in which democratic politics and democratic thinking about markets could take place, and that's flourishing publics. So I'm not, I, so, you know, I do agree with you know, what you inferred, I was saying, should be criticised. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Nathan, I'm a first year student, and I um, just want to make one comment and then I've got a question for you. Um, the comment I have is, um, like, um, most of my friends now, um, happen to come to college, some of them have left school after junior cert, some of them have happened on their leaving cert, some of them are working on building sites now and unemployed, um, heavily dependent on the welfare state. And, um, and what I've noticed in the last few years is a, is, is a trend between all of them. They all have, uh, or have symptoms of mental health issues or um, no confidence in themselves. So that's my comment, and my question is. Uh, these experts that are talking about implementing these neoliberal policies, privatization, privatization of the third level of education, um, are they not uh, thinking about the consequences of that on the wider society, like again, mental health issues and um, high crime high, high rates? Um, how are they going to pay for, for all those problems that's going to occur? Um, like, uh, say, that has happened in the United States, in the United Kingdom as well, uh, wherever the privatized wherever they, they privatise a uh, market, there's, they have to pay for it in a different way. Yeah, I mean, well, there's lip service paid to those issues. So, interestingly, despite the fact that in Britain, the Brown report and the white paper made no mention of the wider benefits of higher education. Indeed, 
almost by the logic of what they were trying to do, they couldn't. Because if you had mentioned the wider benefits, there would have been an argument, well, then there ought to be public support of those wider benefits. And so trying to argue that there should only be private funding of higher education, it would look a bit odd if you started talking about the public benefits of higher education. However, and I think it is a consequence of the campaign for the public university, the government now has published a paper on the wider benefits of higher education, and the wider benefits of higher education are precisely as you say, you know, it improves confidence, well-being, and so on. But it ought not to be the situation that the only way we can produce well-being and confidence is through higher education. So there's a failure for the, you know, the Robbins principle was higher education for all of those with the ability and the inclination and the wish to pursue it. So we ought to also be pursuing decent lives for people who see their lives in terms other than the pursuit of higher education. Otherwise that's a form of narrow elitism. So the real thing that I'm, you know, most, you know, I mean, I just have to say, I'm just most aghast by is the idea that governments can explicitly leave behind a section of the population and, in a sense, project the failure of government as a failure of individuals to behave in the way that governments would wish them to behave. There has to be more respect for people, you know, more respect for, for people than that. And you're certainly not going to get people into higher education, in particular the big thing that's happened in Britain is the collapse of second chances, the collapse of part-time education, and the collapse of, um, of uh, adult uh, returns to education. They've fallen by about 50% uh, since the, the uh, introduction of fees. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's kind of really important. That we do. And I would say, well, if one looked at the Scottish discussion, you will see that the Scottish discussion is about maintaining public higher education, but also having policies for young people who don't go into higher education, and policies that benefit them and treat them with the same sort of respect. So we shouldn't only be respect people who get on and are socially mobile, we should respect people who, you know, and there's no reason why we couldn't improve the lives of everybody. That, for me, is what an inclusive public uh, policy is about. But, one thing I said, because you know, the issue of bankers is raised, it is significant that you know, one aspect of British public life is you sit on a body recommending something, and then you leave that public body in order to join the corporation that benefits from what you're recommending. So it is significant with the Brown Review that Sir Michael Barber, who sat on the Brown Review, is now the head of higher education at Pearson. So those sorts of connections of you know, real, so you say, well, do they not think about well-being? Well, Michael Barber can write about well-being all the time. So lots of stuff on well-being in Michael Barber's writings. You know? One has to imagine that he's sincere, but he's much more sincere about pursuing the interest of person than he is about pursuing the interest of well-being. Okay, we have three more questions here. Could I just ask you to <coughs> we just gather the three questions yeah. and then you ask? So could you please keep it concise and short? <coughs> My name is Kieran McKinley and I'm a project management student at Queen's University in Belfast. Um, you've explained very well where higher education is heading, and yet um, maybe we can elaborate a bit more on where you think it should be going to. So if you had one of these CEOs slash vice chancellors sitting in a room, who was willing to talk, what would you want him to say was his vision or purpose for higher education? Hi, um, my name is Alessandra, I'm a master's student at UCD. And I just want to ask, you said that the plan, the long-term plan is to get the fees, the local, uh, the home fees up to the international student fees level, which is obviously quite a frightening prospect. And how do you see that happening? Um, and how do you see the public reacting to that? I mean, the first thing would be obviously to open the credit lines. But just, I mean, apart from that, like, is the future of the UK just as, as what uh, students are experiencing now in the US? Like, $500,000 in debt when they're done with university. Thank you. Uh, just to the IT, I just had a quick question.
labor market and whether you reference to bundling with research and teaching, whether within that you already consider adjunct lecturing as opposed to contracted salaried positions as reflecting a kind of business for profit model that maybe denigrates the purpose of education but leads to a greater profit. Just one more, yeah. one last one, and then we wrap it up. Uh, Martin Holbrook was involved in a campaign, uh, a charter for the defence of the public university in Ireland. I just want to ask a quick question around the concept of public. Because on the one hand, I absolutely agree with you the importance of reclaiming the word public um, in a privatised world, a market world, and so on. It is incredibly important politically to reclaim that word. And yet, and this is my question to you really, I, I have a difficulty in understanding public in exactly the same way that you do, in the sense that first of all I think that neoliberalism has come from social class, from capital, um, uh, and it has actually become very public, and there's a problem there with our use of the word public. But secondly, the huge divisions in society precisely means that actually people are marginalised they don't have a civic sense, and the very graphs that you show mean that actually people don't identify necessarily with the word public, it's been stolen from them. And so as part of the debate about this university, I would argue, because I'm a Marxist I suppose, that the question of class is important, and has probably never been so important because of the huge divisions in society. And while I absolutely agree with the major problem of inequality, I can't really see how I can analyse that without the question of social class. Okay, well, taking in reverse order, the reason why I don't want to use the language of social class is it's not a language that people otherwise use, and therefore, if you say there's a difficulty in using the language of the public, there is equally a difficulty in using the language of class. So something has to be reclaimed. The reason why I would like to reclaim the idea of public is how does one use class to explain the dominant experience from the 1930s through to the 1980s of declining uh, inequality? It just so happened that capitalism expressed its class relations in terms of increased equality and now it expresses its class relations in terms of widening inequality. I would say, well, reform and the public engagement with reform is possible, and that demonstrates that it's possible, and it's possible precisely because one uses and is outside the language of class. So that's a kind of personal sort of preference, but it you know, doesn't stop us being in favour of the same thing. So you know, I hope that's OK. So, I'm going to have a bash at rehabilitating the idea of the public. Reason for doing that, though, is also because actually the public is continually invoked, and so I think it's really important to subject the public to social, social scientific examination. That usually, in the academy, means deconstruction. And I'd prefer to suggest that the real task for us is to subject it to a work of social scientific construction, not to social scientific uh, uh, deconstruction. I am very much uh, you know, exercised by the issue of uh, casualization and so on. It is about, uh, you know, so the second phase of uh, the efficiency that is being driven by Universities UK is efficiencies in use of staff differently, and in Britain that's associated with zero hours contracts for <coughs> casual uh, staff and so on. So all the problems of the uh, you know, contemporary political economy are inside the university. So if we're an ivory tower, we're an ivory tower uh, based upon the uh, labor in the basement of some people who are you know, being uh, exploited within the activities of, uh, of the university. Can I try to, uh, what would, uh, I know there was another, oh no, I think, I don't know, there was a question of what would I do if I um, had a vice chancellor, you know, got vice chancellors sit there, you know. They are almost a lost case. That is, they are not capable of exercise. So 
when we did you know, the early phase of campaign for the public university was that we wrote to vice chancellors asking, you know, asking them, particularly Russell Group vice chancellors, will you say something about the book? One of them responded by saying, it's completely unfair you say we're not, I've not spoken out. And the example of speaking out was one blog within the vice chancellor's message to his university. That was that vice chancellor speaking out. So they not speak out because they fear the consequences. And if you look at uh, Robin, uh, uh, David Willits has returned to Robins, and you know, because David Willits is this sort of really sort of shiny, happy sort of person. I mean, I, you know, one of the great things about doing blogs is you have to choose an illustration. I've chosen, you know, to illustrate David Willits with a slightly sort of cheerful but uncomprehending robot and he's sitting under a tree with a bird coming out of his head because that's frequently the character of the comments he makes. So at the end of rewriting Robbins he says at last we have finally realized the Robbins principles and one of the things he says is the realization of the Robbins principle is placing education in the Department of Business and Innovation and Science, where there is a minister who recognizes the task is to support science, not to direct it, and to respect the Haldane principle of the independence of science from government. At last, we have the proper governance of science. And what do vice chancellors respond to absolutely the most direct statement of the uh, uh, you know, of, of government interference in science. This is how they respond when David Willett says this. And if you look at the Russell Group website, I'm a member of the Russell Group University, but I switched the camera off. No, I'm a member of the Russell Group University. This is why I've moved on from different universities. No. Not saying I'm a member of the Russell Group. But if you look at the Russell Group website and you look at these public statements of the Russell Group website, they go something like they go something like this. We commend the minister. We commend the minister. We fully support the minister. We support the minister. There's not enough money to go around. Give us more money, give some people less. That's that's the entire policy of the Russell Group uh, uh, University. So when you say talk to a, 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 at the start of the process of the campaign, we thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's true what they're saying, that there is no alternative. So we asked Sir Steve Smith, who was the head of Universities UK at that time, so we're writing a manifesto for the public university. Okay, I believe you when you say that you're not... Um, you know, that you're, you believe the same things as we do, but there's a crisis around uh, money. So we'll give you the last chapter in the book, a statement from the perspective of a vice chancellor and the head of the Universities UK. And I promise you, we won't set you up and we won't write about, we'll just let you defend. So that, you know, that was dialogue. People did criticize. Why did you allow Sir Steve Smith to respond? He couldn't speak about anything else but money. He physically couldn't do it. And there is no vice chancellor who can now do it. And the real, but the real problem, you know, is so why will this thing break? How will people pay those fees? At the moment, the problem with the uh, loan system in Britain is that uh, it's unaffordable. So at the level of £21,000 repayments, not enough will go back to the Exchequer. So at some point, future taxpayers will have to pay the costs of this loan system. And the future taxpayers are not current <coughs> taxpayers, it's graduates with these level fees. And some of them, will be able to, will be paying off their loans, and some of them won't be paying off their loans. And the ones who are paying off their loans will object to paying the taxes for the ones who don't pay off their loans. They'll start talking about paying them twice. This is a built-in taxpayer's revolt. And this 
is the taxpayers' revolt beginning. That is, let's reduce the numbers going to university. And of course, the government is also seeking to identify those courses where graduates do earn sufficient to pay off their loans in order to try and force down the fees at courses that don't appear to give jobs to students who can pay off their loans. I'll let you work out that males are more likely to pay off their loans than female students for particular sorts of reasons. So the whole series of negative things built up. But are we heading towards America? Yes, we are. You know, I mean, probably overtaken them in some respects. Okay, on that cheery note, can I, just, uh, can I just thank the speaker and for an entertaining talk. And, uh